amazing. You are. Okay, hands up, hands up who feels amazing. Uh, hands up who feels like kind of 50% on the amazing scale. Hands up if you're like 10th percentile amazing. Okay, slow. That, that's going to sort out the mathematicians, I think, in the audience. Uh, you are amazing. And I'm going to tell you why you are all absolutely amazing. You are amazing because you start life as one single cell when mummy and daddy love each other very much. <laughs> and, and you become two cells, four cells, eight cells, 16 cells, 32 cells. You become a little football of cells. And right in the middle of that is a tiny blob of stem cells. And every single human that ever lived Every single human started life as this tiny blob of stem cells. It's like a, a biological singularity. It's unique. And by cells making decisions, communicating with each other, going, right, we're, we're head end, your bum. We're outside, we're inside. We're going to be tubes. We're going to be brain. We're going to be liver. We're going to be heart. By switching genes on and off, by responding to signals, coming in from the environment around them, by communicating through little kind of molecular messages. This blob of stem cells grew and grew and multiplied and specialized to make you. And we are all unique. Some of you look a bit more unique than others, but you know, we are all wonderfully and amazingly, incredibly unique. And we are all the products of our genes. And we're also the products of our environment as well. Let's not forget, it's nature and it's nurture. There's no kind of false argument here. But we are amazing. And we're made up of all sorts of different kinds of cells. You're made of, of skin cells, of bone cells, of brain cells, of pancreas cells, of whatever it is that makes your toenails. You know, we're made of all these incredible types of cells. And they all switch on different genes to make them the kinds of cells that they're going to be. So I've spent the past kind of <laughs> career, uh, if you want to call my very haphazard kind of dash through the world from the lab through to a, a, a job at Cancer Research UK and now freelance writer, trying to understand how our genes work, what on earth is going on. And uh, I've written a book. This is branding here. <laughs> um, so I've, I've written a book all about how our genes work. Have we got any biologists in? Give me a cheer if you would identify as a biologist. Yeah. Okay, minority. Uh, but I've, uh, I thought I would give you a quick reading, which explains about how I first came to understand a bit about genes. And it's from the introduction to the book, which is called It's All About That Base, B-A-S-E. That's a biology joke. Biologists, give me a laugh. <laughs> yeah, right. So all the rest of you, like, this is my moment when I feel like the English students watching Shakespeare in Love. It's like, ha, 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 ha. You don't get that? No, you don't, never mind. En <laughs> engineers. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's risky up here. OK, so I thought I'd do, do a little reading, which explains. My first real brush with genetics came while I was at secondary school, courtesy of our formidable deputy headmaster, Mr Myers. As well as stalking the school corridors with a steely glare of stern disapproval, doling out detentions seemingly at random, he also doubled as a biology teacher. One day, it was his turn to preside over our regular school assembly. We dutifully trooped into the main hall to sit cross-legged on the floor, doing our best to avoid his eye. He took to the stage, black academic gown flowing out behind him like a cape, clasping in his hand what looked like a magazine, but must have been a scientific journal of some kind. Towering in impotent fury from the stage, he shook it at us in disapproval as if it were a piece of pornography fished out from behind a cistern in the boys' toilets. Look at this, he thundered, slapping at a page covered in the letters A, C, T and G, repeated in seemingly endless permutations. It's like the phone book, all these letters, 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 letters. This 
is biology nowadays. <laughs> so, you know, many of us are familiar with uh, the DNA double helix. It's that kind of spiral that advertisers use to go, ooh, science. And, uh, and we hear about genes all the time. We read about them in the papers. They're the things that make our eyes blue. They make our hair curl. They make us fat. They give us cancer. But, like, how do they work? And I would sit and I'd talk to my, my non-scientist friends in the pub, because I've still got some, and, uh, and I would say, you know, do, do you know how genes work? And they all went, no. And so I thought, OK, there's something in here. And I went round and I talked to loads of scientists that I knew working in genetics, people that I'd, I'd known from my research career. I just emailed Nobel Prize winners and went, hi, can I come and have a chat? And they're like, yeah. Uh, it was amazing. And I said to them all, I, I'm writing a book about how genes work, because I don't think people know. And they all looked at me and went, when you find out, let me know. Because <laughs> it turns out it's really complicated. And there's loads of stuff we know about the basics of how our genes work. And there's loads of stuff we don't know. So uh, one of the things that you know, we don't know, I'm going to tell you my favourite fact in all of biology right now. You ready for this? You're made up of trillions of cells. That's the tiny building blocks that make you up. In every single one of your cells, there is two meters of DNA. In every single cell, nearly every cell. Your blood cells don't have DNA. Pedants, please don't write to me. Uh, you, every single cell, two meters of DNA. If you took all the DNA out of all the cells in your body, you'd be dead. Uh, also, you would have enough DNA to go to the moon and back 1,500 times. I think that's incredible. It's two metres of DNA. I am a short woman. I am five feet tall. The DNA in one of my liver cells is taller than I am. And, you know, when we see Sir, Sir Brian of Cox doing his telly thing, and he's like... Look at, look at the stars, <laughs> look at the universe, look at the millions, the billions. I'm like, your own body, Brian. That is amazing. <laughs> because in a, in a structure, in a cell smaller than the head of a pin, you have two metres of DNA coiled and twisted and wrapped around and squished. And somehow, somehow it works. The right genes get turned on at the right time in the right place to make you who you are, to build the structures of your body, to, to enable you to respond to your environment, to stay healthy, to, to stay alive. And I think that is absolutely incredible. And in writing this book, I wanted to get across one really key thing, one key thing. And if you take away nothing else from my talk about, apart from like, where did she get that dress? I know, it's sweet. Uh, <laughs> And it is this, there is no such thing as a gene for, right? When people say, oh, genes for schizophrenia, 100 genes for intelligence, a gene for cancer, a gene for heart disease, a gene for diabetes, they don't exist. There is no such thing as a gene for. Genes, if we kind of want to make a Bake Off analogy here, because I've just got into Bake Off, uh, there is no such thing as a gene for, because the genes are the recipes that our cells use to bake stuff. And the stuff they bake are proteins. And you're made of proteins. You've got like sturdy proteins in your skin, stuff called keratin, keeps your outsides out, keeps your insides in. Your brain is full of proteins, molecules sending signals. Uh, who's had dinner? If you've had dinner, you're digesting your food using proteins. So we're making all these kinds of proteins all the time. You are just one big molecular bake-off, basically, right now. So there's lots of things that we know about the very basic process about how that works, how our genes get read, how we make proteins. But then there's a lot we don't know. So, you know, you have this two metres of DNA. You have about 20,000 genes, but less than 2% of all that DNA is actually genes. And also, not all genes are turned on in all cells, because if that was the case, all your cells would be the same, and you'd just be this like, kind of big ball of putty. Just, I mean, that would be weird. Um, so we need to turn our genes on and off at the right time, the right place. 
So then there's a, another little bit of your DNA, about 7 to 10%, that's full of control switches. Turn your genes on at the right time, in the right place. And in my book, there's loads of stories about these switches, about how they're responsible for giving cats extra thumbs, how they're responsible for giving sticklebacks like pelvises with death spikes on. Uh, there's all sorts of stories in here. There's a, one of the things I discovered is that there's a control switch for a gene uh, that's called KIT-LG, and it's involved in lots of things in the body. It's involved in making blood cells, it's involved in making eggs and sperm and stuff like that. But it's also involved in the pigment that colours your, your skin and your hair. And one single letter change in this switch is the difference between being a blonde and a brunette. And a different switch that turns on this gene in the skin, one letter different can be the difference between having light skin and having dark skin. And as I was discovering this story and writing about it in the book, uh, it was the time of the Ferguson race riots in the US, and the country was just tearing itself apart over one letter in three billion letters of DNA that make up your genome. I'm like, wow, we're stupid. Because we're all a bit mutant when it comes down to it, we're all full of all sorts of variations in our DNA that make us unique. You know, we've all got different sized livers because of our genetics, but we're not racist about people's livers, are we? So they're on the inside. So I think there's a lot that we can learn about how our genes make us who we are, how they interact with our environment, the nature and the nurture. And, uh, and then there's some really weird stuff. And I went to talk to an incredible woman scientist who works in Nice. She's called Minu Russell Zadigan. And she told me a story about these mice. And these mice are super cute that she has. They, uh, they basically, you know how Mickey Mouse has the little gloves, the little kind of jazz hand, little white gloves? These mice have little white socks. They're so cute. They have little white gloves, little white socks. And the end of their tail has a little white tip. And the weird thing about this mice, these mice, is that, you know, if you do kind of standard genetics, you take a mouse that's got the socks and a mouse that hasn't got the socks and you breed them together, all the baby mice have little socks. And I, I don't want to go into, like, the rules of inheritance here, but let's say if you breed those mice together, you should get some mice with socks and some mice without the socks. She discovers that they all have the socks. Now... You know, you could say, OK, well, well, maybe there's something weird going on and, and just they've all inherited the, the gene that's making them have these socks. And you look at some of these mice with socks and they haven't got the gene variation that, that should do it. Well, that's weird. And then you start breeding from them and they still have it. And that is really weird. That is something that's going on in the environment or that's a change that's happening to these mice that has been passed on, not in the genes. Now, this is kind of weird. And it's sort of on the fringes at the moment, and people are trying to figure it out, and we think that it might be little tiny fragments of a molecule called RNA, similar to DNA, a bit different, that might be coming down in, like, in the eggs and the sperm and going from generation to generation. And it could be manipulated by things like diet and lifestyle and the things that happen to you in your lifetime. There are incredible things afoot in genetics. So uh, I, I'm, I think I'm probably out of time. I will encourage you to please do read my book. There's one left on the stall, but it's available from all good booksellers um, and also Amazon. Uh, <laughs> harsh. Um, oh, and there's an audio book with me narrating it. If you want to hear the worst German accent in the world, you may listen to it. So I'll just very, very briefly uh, read from the, the last, the very last paragraph of the book, which kind of sums up where I'd got to in my journey. If you were hoping for a nice, neat conclusion to this book, wrapping everything up and explaining how your genes work, then I'm afraid there isn't one. There's a lot we do know, and hopefully I've given you a flavour of some of the things researchers have discovered along the way. But there's a great deal that is currently unknown and probably many things that are simply unknowable. What's clear is that we need to banish the idea that our genome is a fixed, 
deterministic blueprint that controls how we turn out right from the moment when egg and sperm meet. Being alive and existing in our environment is what constructs us in all our wobbly, unique and mysterious glory. Enjoy it. Thank you very much.